Okay, welcome to Free Radical Radio. This is Bellamy, and in the studio with me today is Jason McQuinn, the editor of Modern Slavery, the journal, and former editor of Anarchy, a Journal of Desire Armed. Thanks for joining us today, Jason. Thanks for having me. Okay, and so we wanted to start off talking about your critical self-theory essay, which appears in the third volume of Modern Slavery. And can you talk a bit about this, just the overall idea of critical self-theory for those who might not be familiar with your ideas? It's a very simple idea. It's just a matter of trying to flesh out uh, what's involved in really thinking for oneself. Uh, it's something that uh, many people talk about what it means to think for yourself, but in practice, most of the time when anyone who's not an anarchist and not an atheist and not uh, shall we say, an egoist in the sense of Schirner, uh, Max Schirner, uh, brings it up. They always want to uh, make that self that's thinking uh, some kind of objectified uh, other, uh, uh, something that's not really the person who's speaking, uh, the center of the thinking, instead of having a person develop it on their own with no presuppositions according to their own desires at the moment, here and now. So there's two different things there, and so I specify under uh, critical cell theory, a, a type of critical theory, which means something, a theory that's consciously critical, uh, <clears throat> that's a self theory uh, that begins from one's own life experience here and now, as you're experiencing it without any presuppositions of our preconceptions of what you are your world or any other aspect of life is. Um, and that could be completely uh, revisable and redeployed, rethought, uh, not fixed in any way um, at any time, and uh, totally flexible for whatever projects you want to engage in, not uh, subjected to any outside standards or ideas, uh, conditions pretty much. Mm -hmm. And talk a bit about what motivated you to write this essay, because in the introduction to Modern Slavery, Volume 3, you talk about how you, you'd been wanting to write it for a long time. I think you even said threatening to write it for a long time. So what made you want to write this, and who do you perceive as your audience when you're writing this? So when I say I wanted to write it a long time, basically a lot of what it is is uh, an update of... Uh, Max Schirner's critique uh, for modern in modern terminology uh, and in modern conditions. Although there's other things involved too, it's not not only a uh, interested in Schirner, but he's the the most coherent uh, anarchist uh, theorist I, I've ever read. And I happened to read him when I was 18 years old, I think, um, at the same time as I was reading Paul Goodman, who I think is you know, for 20th century. Uh, American anarchist, the, uh, probably the most coherent and interesting uh, theorist um, as well. And uh, so really my perspective is, uh, along with my own personal uh, uh, life experience, uh, kind of a combination of Paul Goodman and uh, Max Stirner, uh, along with, of course, taking into account the whole history of the anarchist milieu and all the other theorists. Um, so anyway, I've had this reading of Schoener and Paul Goodman a long time ago that I put together and uh, basically thought was pretty obvious from reading those two, uh, if you were paying close attention and not just taking uh, third-party assessments or taking the usual uh, cliched interpretations uh, that people make uh, of, of them. Um, and you know, if you really looking at the core of what they're trying to say. Um, that resonated with me a lot, and I thought, hey, there's going to be other people out there who also perceive this, but in my experience over the decades now since then, uh, I have been disappointed in not seeing very many people appreciate what uh, I think the core of what Paul Goodman and what uh, Max Schoener were trying to communicate to people. And 
I always thought that someone would be uh, working on uh, uh, helping to explain to a wider audience what, what, what they were really doing. And I've rarely seen anybody try. And so I've uh, decided at a certain point that probably later on, I would do it myself if nobody else did it. And now it's later on. I've done my other projects. <laughs> I published Anarchy Magazine for 25 years. I published Alternative Press Review, did a few years of North American Anarchist Review. Um, had other projects before that. And, and in the middle of that as well, I used to do a a tabloid for a while that was just uh, handed out free in uh, Missouri that was called Modern Slavery, uh, which is where the title for our current journal project comes oh, from. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, done lots of things and decided, hey, if I'm, not gonna, if I'm ever going to do this, I might as well do it now. I've been threatening for a long time to write something that nobody else did, and now, okay, I'm going to work on it. Mm-hmm. So the essay is a first shot. I'm going to put together a book that, you know, is going to go into it in a little more detail. Okay. So that's, you know, there's another threat there. I'm going to, yeah, whether anybody likes it or not, it's going to go out there. It's recorded, not to. So a lot of the critical self theory piece after you, you lay out the, you call the anatomy of self theory and then the anatomy of heteronomous theory. Uh, I'd say maybe the bulk of the second half of the essay is a a big attack on the history of Western philosophy and portraying it as a kind of original mistake that just kept being, elaborated on or original deception that just kept taking on new forms of slave theory, as you call it. Yet you yourself are clearly well-read in philosophy. Um, Do you feel that you got a lot out of that? What do you think an anarchist relationship to the history of Western philosophy might be? Well, number one, if you're going to be critical of something, you have to be, uh, you have to have been exposed to it and uh, learn enough about it to be able to criticize it um, but and I wouldn't I wouldn't point I wouldn't uh, necessarily say I'm so much opposed or critical of philosophy only that's just I think one manifestation of the underlying problem which mm-hmm. I would conceive more generally just to be a religious mode of thinking a spiritualizing mode of thinking there's been a split um, in uh, human history, as far as I can see from what I know about it, and prehistory. Um, And that split can be conceptualized in lots of ways. Um, I think the most coherent and most important way to conceptualize it is uh, a split between uh, an imaginary conceptual essence of what reality is versus what we just live without thinking about it with or without um, trying to objectify. Um, so life, I think, is when you when it comes down to it, if you think about your own life or you just perceive it without thinking about it, is a series of experiences or even if you want to get before using concepts like series, it is one experience, or if you want to get beyond uh, even the word experience, you know, it's just um, what you live through. Um, You can't, I can't communicate to anybody without using words, and words are going to be always a little bit uh, misleading at the same time as they reveal things, so there's never a perfect way to say it. It's all basically a matter of how good of a poet are you, and I'm not the best poet, but I try to put things in as clear a way as I can. Um, So basically before we can imagine, we don't know because we weren't there, but before humanity invented language, Mm -hmm. there was no religion, there was no philosophy. Mm -hmm. It would be hard to imagine that there was any way. You can can try if you want. Um, But if there were no things like this, and then... People started communicating in ways that objectified sounds uh, to use them as signs for, you know, being put together in more complex forms. Eventually, they got to the point of being able to invent God or spirits, I should say, first, before there was a one single God required 
the invention of spirits, which, uh, and then they went through a whole evolution of uh, becoming more powerful and uh, uh, it took a long time before people finally got to the point of taking all those spirits and then putting them all into one and making monotheism. Um, and I think from that whole evolution of religion, um, that's where philosophy comes from, especially when we get to monotheism and uh, then the theories of reality that are you know, part of philosophy are a somewhat secularized version of religion, although still the regional religious impulse of objectifying a reality that's outside of ourselves is always still enclosed in that. Um, it's always a uh, presupposition of that, and it, I think it's not too uh, much hidden. It's pretty obvious if you're looking for that. So anyway, from my perspective, the reason that this whole split in culture, in uh, religion, what, what became religion, what became philosophy, occurred um, so virulently is that at the same time, back in the origins of uh, religion, uh, people uh, became enslaved to varying degrees. Uh, we don't know what the original form of that was, but we can guess. You know, there were conflicts. Uh, some people were defeated. Some people were killed, some people were you know, run, away, run out. Uh, sometimes somebody who was particularly, uh, say they could be particularly vicious or they could be particularly uh, uh, compassionate feeling and, and took a slave instead of killing somebody, right? You could look at it either way. I think it's pretty, <laughs> pretty vicious, but you know, some people could think they're having a, you know, I'm being really nice to this person, I'm not yeah, killing them, charitable. I'm just gonna make them a slave. Yeah. Um, and you know, originally the first slaves that were ever taken were not, uh, it wasn't a easy, very easy thing to do if there's no institution, if there's no social backup. Well, the there's person no escape with the same first yeah. opportunity or get killed if they displease their master or whatever, but it's not something that's going to stick around. So um, undoubtedly, uh, I shouldn't say undoubtedly, but um, you know, most likely there could have been uh, millennia where somebody here and there took a slave or you know tried things that appeared to be something like that. Uh, but was nothing that was socially uh, maintainable because it's not institutionalized as a collective uh, thing. It took the development of religion to the point where we could have a multiple uh, uh, person uh, hierarchy within a community that could then uh, create the conditions for everybody operating in unison, uh, with a collective identity of working with the slave owner to keep the, the slaves from uh, escaping or you know, fighting back, whatever, before the institution of slavery could take hold. And I want to you know, think about the fact that also slavery can't take hold as long as people refuse to be slaves. Well, if you can, you can take a, you know, make somebody a slave, but if they refuse to do what you want, well, you don't have too many options except uh, um, you know, beating them up or torturing them or killing them, whatever, and if people still refuse, well, they can't be made into slaves if they don't want to. Of course, it's hard to resist, and most people aren't going to be very uh, happy uh, trying hard, so they're going to fake being a slave and then try to escape or whatever. But what happened, I think, over time is that, you know, if you're pretty effectively kept in slave conditions for years, you, it becomes harder and harder to have the habit of not doing things that are going to get you injured or killed or whatever. Uh, at the same time as you maintain that awareness that you're not really a slave and that you're going to get out, get the hell out of there as soon as possible. So people do sometimes eventually get con uh, convinced that they are slaves in such conditions. Well, we've all been convinced. Uh, I shouldn't say we've all, but I say in this culture, most everybody obviously has been convinced that they are slaves and they really are not resisting uh, because they identify with all the uh, roles and uh, the demands that are put on them uh, as being what a normal life should be here. And so there's, there's been this whole uh, development of what I would just call habits of submission uh, that has become more complex over time and more of a highly... Uh, integrated uh, controlling web that makes it harder for people to even understand how they got to where they're at. Um, and that's what I'm trying to 
unveil when I do the work on the critical uh, cell theory project as well as the modern slavery project for the journal and everything. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I want to touch on the idea of media later, but for now I want to, um, would you mind defining the distinction that you make between self theory and heteronomous theory? We've touched on it, obviously you've been talking about it, but just to make a, a clear definition for those that haven't read your piece yet. So yeah, I mean, well, basically if you're going to talk about self theory or that's just autonomous theory, it's not a theory of the self per se, although you're going to have theories of the self within self theory. Uh, when I talk about self theory, I mean basically something that's uh, self-directed theory. Um, so if you're going to have self-directed theory, there's a, the opposite of that, the, the other of that, which is theory that comes from outside of your own decision making. Well, I don't really think there is such a thing because I don't think people can do anything that's, you know, I don't think there is any, really any gods, any uh, uh, separate uh, nature or something like that that's operating through people's, uh, what would appear to be their autonomous uh, uh, life experience. I don't really believe that's the case, but most people do. Um, so we need to have a conception for what that is uh, to think that. And so that's what I mean by heteronomous theory is any theory that seems to come from some entity outside of yourself. Um, of course, to think that there's something outside of yourself already um, would be a separation that I don't believe in either, right? So that's one reason why I don't believe that there is anything that's, that, that's coming from outside, because I don't believe there is any outside. I believe that. I shouldn't say I even believe. <laughs> I perceive no separation between uh, my self and a world in, in the sense of, of uh, one part being separable from the other. In my experience, there's a unity there. Um, of course, I can perceive a difference between my body and outside uh, but I don't make a, I don't make an assumption of there being uh, some particular theory of reality. Um, what I would like to do is say that if we're going to talk about a real self-directed theory, a self critical self theory, we need to re always have in mind that we don't want to make any presuppositions, uh, conceptual presuppositions. The only presupposition is our actual life that we're living, um, which doesn't require thinking. Uh, we can think when we're living, but we don't have to. And that's one of the things I love about Sterner when he says, you know, if you're troubled by your thoughts too much, just stretch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, do something with your body, you know, j <laughs> yeah, jump up and jaunty leap or something like that. Yeah. There's, there's all kinds of things you can do without thinking, and that's what your real life is. The thoughts are, they're, they're great. They, they give you, they're very powerful. The reason that thoughts have somewhat taken over is that uh, they are powerful things that we can use for, for accomplishing all kinds of things we couldn't do without them. But the, um, the reason they've taken over is because there also is that simultaneously in, in this development of uh, habits of submission that have led to uh, multifarious versions of slavery throughout history and now in our current version of modern slavery in which uh, the tentacles of power are so intermeshed everywhere it's hard for people to see where anything or originates and makes it really hard for people to get back to uh, their own lives as they uh, live it without uh, incorporating all kinds of external concepts of control uh, that they've developed habits of using so often that it, that they can't just can't, can't drop it anymore. I'd like everybody to try to the extent you can to drop every form of, to unlearn every form of submission, um, every form of unthinking adherence to certain concepts that uh, you believe are more important than your own life or more real than your own life or more you know, better than your own life or whatever it might be, something outside that for one reason or another, you take to be more real than yourself, including concepts like nature, God, state, uh, politics, uh, anarchy, 
anything else, right? I'd, I'd like us to get back to thinking about ourselves in a more fluid, less uh, pretentious, less uh, uh, uncritical way, and uh, relate to each other directly as much as possible and in small groups as much as possible and always be self-critical and critical when we're talking to other people with, and not try to impose any of these uh, habitual uh, submissive uh, conceptions of reality which include things like you know, one thing uh, uh, would be the idea that there has to be an economy uh, that everybody has to plug into or that there has to be some kind of political system or even anti-political system that everybody has to plug into as opposed to us creating our relationships all the time. So yeah, what it comes down to basically is you can view your life as one big episode, one big uh, adventure of self-creation, or you can view your life as um, some kind of, I, I like to call uh, the small self theory, where you're confined to some small little place within your body, maybe, or maybe even smaller than your body, maybe you're in your brain, or maybe you're uh, you know, even, even smaller than that, or maybe you're you know, somebody who has some property and you also consider your car part of your body or something, or yourself, um, and your other possessions that are legally uh, your property. Um, any, any of that stuff is, I think, taking a small view of your life and limiting yourself instead of looking at the whole world as your life. And, and you have a right to intervene anywhere in, the, in your world, not a right as in political right, but you have the ability, I should say, to intervene uh, anywhere. And so if you take the larger view, you're always going to have more options. You're going to be able to do more things. It doesn't mean you should ignore the fact that other people don't agree with you and are going to react in certain ways. But certainly don't let yourself uh, be limited by taking on this all these possible views that uh, con con uh, that uh, restrict your abilities to move, live, relate, etc. Always try to uh, unlearn all those habits and expand your life wherever you can. And if everybody were trying to do that, not if everybody, if even 5% of the world were trying to expand their lives constantly all the time, I think it would be an irresistible force. Um, it would be so subversive, it would be so... Uh, uh, seductive that uh, uh, it would uh, be an amazing uh, tidal wave of anarchy that would be unleashed. So that's what I would like to encourage people to at least consider. I don't want anybody to do anything uh, suicidal. I don't want to do anybody to do anything and get some, themselves in prison. But I do think everybody can take a little bit of risk here and there and try to open up things a little more and do it in a way that is uh, likely to lead other people to also see the value of being more freely in that sense, uh, more autonomously, basically, and not always trying to worry about external rules, external uh, powers uh, that are really mostly imaginary. So one criticism I've heard of your critical self-theory piece is that you falsely position autonomous and heteronomous theory as opposites, and some would say that they're not opposites so much as they have a more complex intersecting relationship and that taking heteronomous perspectives, for instance, allow us different insights into ourselves. So we can see ourselves as biological beings, as social beings. We can bring the question of human agency under scrutiny and, um, or see ourselves maybe as creatures that aren't entirely self-transparent. And even your critical self-theory draws on some heteronomous ideas, right? Ideas about what human prehistory might have been. And um, you also talk about children acquiring language and that it's not an imposition on them, as some might imagine, but allows them another opportunity for self-creation as they develop their own way of speaking. So can you explain what seems like it might be a dissonance or a contradiction? Uh, one of the interesting things about reading Max Stirner to uh, uh, get to the fundamental question I think that's behind all this, is that uh, most people when they read him, they put their own assumptions about what he's saying in his mouth or in his writings. Uh, and so what he tries to convey 
um, using certain words instead of taking a look at how he's using those words in his own manner as a practice for helping people unlearn habits of thinking submission. Um, they tend to take their own ideas of these things and substitute them for his and then say, hey, but he's talking and he's saying things that are opposite of what he said other in other places. But I think that's the same thing going on here. Um, it's amazing uh, to me that many people are so uncomfortable with the idea of autonomous thinking without a master, without a God above them that gives them, you know, allows them to think within certain limits or without a nature scientifically conceived or spiritually conceived that uh, gives them permission to be who they are to whatever degree nature or their idea of nature says they can, can do things. People are so uncomfortable with the idea of there not being that permission, that external master, that external slave owner, uh, that they'll look for any excuse not to think for themselves. And so I think that's what we're seeing here. Um, if you have a problem with that, always think, why am I worried about not taking into account this external thing that's telling me this? Why am I not criticizing that and saying, I actually created that idea. It's not something that came from you know, the, uh, some, some mystical experience I had of God or a mystical experience I had of uh, nature or whatever else. Not that we don't have mystical experiences, but what I, want to, what, I, what I mean by that is when we do have such experiences, those things are uh, always uh, something that... Uh, are not complete. They're uh, not any way of, we're, we're, when we have an experience of anything and we're dividing um, the I from what it is we're experiencing, uh, there's always a, uh, uh, an encounter there. And when we have an encounter, any encounter, we can see if we uh, think about it is going to be of a, a certain surface or face of uh, what we construct to be a larger uh, uh, series of possible entities behind that. Well, those and those things we construct are our constructions. They're not anything we directly experience. And the reality of them is always going to be a provisional thing that we can test by uh, further interactions with, uh, for instance, another person uh, or uh, with... Uh, different uh, landscape or uh, whatever else we're looking at. Um, but what happens is people make those constructions and then they assume that the construction itself is a reality behind what they're experiencing. And then they start uh, interacting in a way that uh, uh, restricts their ability to revise those constructions uh, practically, pragmatically, instrumentally for whatever they want, and, the, and they start allowing those constructions to impose uh, uh, restrictions on their own ability to live uh, in ways that aren't aren't actually uh, there, but that they imagine are there. And so, I think that's the the whole process going on here. So, when we talk about heteronymous things, of course. I have nothing against imagining any possible heteronomy that you can imagine, uh, you know, hey, imagine whatever you want. I want no restrictions on anybody's imagination. All I'm, all I'm asking is to think about uh, whether or not you really want to alienate those constructed imaginings of heteronomy as being entities more important than your own life or that control your own life. Um, which then means you're relinquishing your own responsibility for the life you're making and putting it on those entities, which uh, I find is a way of being evasive. And I would like to live with lots of people who will take total responsibility for their own self-creation uh, along with me, and I think it could be a much more interesting <laughs> Uh, exciting world because then we could work on projects together that would enhance each other instead of always instead working on projects that help to reinforce uh, 
all the repressive, exploitative entities in the world, like the state, like every institution that uh, functions in a, uh, uh, say, a transcendent, uh, ex ex existent uh, way, as all of our current major institutions in uh, our world do. Um, if we can avoid that, the more we can avoid it, the more we can do something that would be considered more of an anarchist uh, uh, way of relating. And so I don't have any particular demands that everybody think in a certain way at all. I just would like to live in a world where everybody was trying to be as free in this sense as possible of self-limiting imagined entities that are basically little gods or spirits all over the place that we're fetishizing. So you would say critical self-theory is essentially an egoist position? So, yeah, I, I, I did mention uh, egoism at the beginning. I don't tend to do that. I don't really, I, I usually avoid the term because I think uh -huh. it's too likely to be taken wrongly because, well, most people don't use it in the same sense that Max Stirner did. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, hardly anybody uses it in the sense he did. Therefore, in modern uh, uh, in contemporary uh, philosophy, in contemporary theory, calling yourself an egoist is inviting uh, as much misconception as calling yourself an anarchist or calling yourself an atheist or you know, calling yourself yeah. anything. So I try, in general, I don't try, I just don't bother using the word usually, but for this audience I did. Um, there's nothing wrong with using the word egoism, it's just that if you're going to do it and you really mean something particular by it, you have to make it clear what you mean. And so mm -hmm. when I talk about egoism in a positive way, in a way that I would, you know, sometimes, rarely, but sometimes use, um, it's the same way in which I see Mike Sterner using the word, and what he's talking about, uh, just to give a quick overview, is not any of the typical ways it's used in modern philosophy. So in modern philosophy, typically, is, you know, we're talking about egoism as being an ethical theory, mm -hmm. a rational theory of egoism, or a psychological theory of egoism. And I would say none of those apply, because for all those theories, usually what we're doing is looking at the idea of self-interest and objectifying it and putting it outside of anybody's actual lived self-interest. And so Stirner has the opposite idea, which is to, if you're going to call something somebody's self-interest, well, it's what they're doing. If they weren't doing it, it wouldn't be their self-interest. So there's no division between that self-interest and a person's life. Therefore, it's not something to be objectified and say, well, you should be an egoist because you should follow yourself. Well, everybody's already doing it. It's not something that needs to be you need to tell anybody to do under that conception. But that conception is, just like I was saying, for, for other reasons, uh, a hard thing for people to uh, consistently use because they'd rather make it into a external thing that, that a self-interest, well, that's bad if we do self-interest because then it means this other, well, it doesn't really mean anything because if it's really taken in the way Sterner uses it or the way I'd like to use it when I talk about an egoism that I would prefer, um, we're talking about just what we actually do. So what we actually do is not always the great thing, but um, what I'd like to do is encourage conscious egoism. So it's not a matter of egoism per se, it's the consciousness of what we're doing. If we can be conscious and critical of what we're doing, we could be more effective egoists. Um, I think, uh, you know, that means instead of uh, allowing ourselves to uh, objectify certain parts of our lives or reality as entities that we need to submit to, uh, we can choose to resist that submission and uh, become greater masters of our inter, uh, interrelated lives. Um, that's an that's existential choice. It's not a true or false question or anything like that, right? It's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a choice of a way of being, and I like people to just have that idea that um, to choose that way of being is what Max Stirner is talking about when he's talking about egoism. Um, I don't know, I guess I've otherwise lost the thread of where you were going with that now. A... Oh, sure. I was going to touch on the fact that egoism gets consistently misinterpreted as either what I would 
say is more accurately called narcissism, where we uh, we objectify the self and turn it into this fixed idea that then we're supposed to work toward, or a kind of solipsism. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask if you or how you felt about the criticism that critical self theory, if we're always being strictly empirical, nominalist, uh, phenomenological, and um, instrumentalist about everything, do, do we end up with this kind of impoverished world that uh, collapses everything into solipsism? So, yeah, I mean, that, that's the, as I was saying before, that's the tiny self theory where right. people want to impose that tiny self on, on everyone because they have a tiny self. Well, I don't have a tiny self. Forget that. <laughs> solipsism, no. The world is me. I'm, a, I'm everywhere, you know. I'm out in that world. Um, you, you don't Which is to, kind of related to Stirner's idea of ownness. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I own the whole world. It's mine to the extent mm -hmm. that I have powers within it, which means perception, powers of perception, powers of action. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you don't feel that way, you know, I don't want to say, uh, you know, you're, there's something wrong with you, but I don't agree with you, and I would like you to try to open your eyes and try to, you know, expand your idea of your life. And if you want to have the idea that you're a tiny self and that if you only looked at your self-interest because you're such a tiny self that you're a sol solipsist or something, you know, um, you know, that's too bad, I guess. But, you know, try expanding your life and thinking about what it would be like to be everywhere at once and involved with everybody that you're related to in a consciously self-critical way and I think you'd have a whole different attitude about that. So I, I'd say that's the problem of everybody who wants to enforce the tiny self, which I think is something that goes along with leftism and uh, that's mm -hmm. why I'm a post-leftist because one of the things about leftism is uh, the, the acceptance of tiny self uh, uh, identities and of, all, of all sorts and so I want to break out of that. So an, another criticism I've heard is that a few times in the essay you seem to slip into making claims about the real or the objective world as it is or the world from God's point of view, which seems to be at odds with the kind of strict phenomenological and instrumentalist perspective you're putting out there. So a few times I think maybe kind of necessarily from a rhetorical point of view you seem to be exhorting others to engage with this. So you use pronouns like we and one, and talk in a prescriptive way about how someone might use critical self-theory. So wouldn't that be a, a necessarily heteronomous perspective? So, you know, we do have uh, parts of, uh, uh, what we say, now how, can I, how can I put this? Well, as I said earlier, when we use language, we have the opportunity to use these signs uh, and combine them in different ways and convey them with in different situations and with different face-to-face, uh, -face, with different bodily attitudes, um, or at least if I'm a, a voiceless, uh, I mean, uh, uh, see, not, not appearing a voice uh, only uh, mm -hmm. on a radio uh, show, uh, with my inflection of my voice and everything, you can tell that I'm not a machine, I hope, um, and, a, and uh, someone who's trying to communicate with you. Um, we have uh, all these uh, abilities to use these signs, but those abilities, uh, any, any tool we have has advantages. It has things that it's more or less uh, powerful at doing, and it has disadvantages as well. Along with every tool, you have the disadvantages of that tool as well. And, you know, as speaking instrumentally, which I think is uh, basically... Uh, we're talking about instrumentally, practically is another term uh, that equally would apply. Um, that's less uh, of a disapproved uh, notion for some people, anyway. Um, if if you're gonna if you're gonna speak of things, you can't uh, talk about uh, very complex uh, uh, meta issues like this without. Uh, using words in ways that approach the boundaries of where they're uh, going to be uh, easily understood. And so then people who read what you're writing or listen to what you're saying are more and more on those boundaries apt to misunderstand what, you're, what the essence or the uh, uh, meaning is behind your communication attempts and 
put in the extra uh, metaphysical or religious or essentialist or reified uh, ideas that they usually have of those terms. And so I would like everybody, if they're going to read what I say in the critical self theory essay or in other places, to always have that in mind that when they think that I'm trying to say something uh, that seems self-contradictory, how much of that has to do with the way that we have to fight our way through this language that's been used to uh, enslave us in so many ways to a point of uh, uh, breaking out of that and how much of it is, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, faultless, sometimes I do make mistakes just like everyone. And so I might have used a, a term in a way that would be better used, uh, that I could have had an alternative formulation for. But if you even look at uh, Max Schoenerter's uh, accounts of when he wrote uh, uh, Unique and its Property, uh, he talks about this issue of language also and how he had to struggle uh, to try to convey things. And uh, even though he thought he had pretty well explained it, and I think he did a great job, a one amazing job for 1844, 1843, uh, when he was writing this, um, other people make the same kind of criticisms of him as, well, you know, he's saying, you know, we should all be egoists, and if we're an egoist, we, you know, this this, this narrow little thing. Well, no, it's not what he's saying. He didn't say that in, in that way. That's a, a interpretation of his words that people are putting on it by refusing to look at how he's undermined the traditional notion of egoism to begin with, um, and not given it in a, any essentialist definition. Um, and uh, you know, he was so far ahead of his time that he even, uh, when he talks about the unique one, the unique one is genderless. There's no male uh, imposed uh, thought there. He's making it obvious, uh, if you read the original German especially, that uh, he's uh, taking into account uh, also the female or feminine point of view without uh, excluding it as almost all philosophy and religion did in the 1800s. Even the most uh, liberated uh, um, had problems with that, but he's just you know taking it for granted that there's no uh, uh, there's no restrictions on on this. There's no uh, restriction on what kind of uh, uh, being uh, classifications you might be in as to you know uh, being being an egoist or whatever. So I mm -hmm. could go on, and, but I don't want to belabor this all too much. Yeah. So jumping off from critical self theory a bit into more general questions, I we talked briefly before the interview. Um, I, I, something I find interesting as far as metaphysical attachments is the, at least in my experience, widespread fixation among anarchists with the idea of free will. And it, it comes across both in a lot of the sort of flowery rhetoric, but also just in conversations, this idea of free will and this reluctance to entertain any kind of theory that might deny that on the one hand. And then when you get more into the structuralism, post-structuralism that you talk about in the critical self-theory piece, the downplay and denial of human agency on the other hand. So what do you think an anarchist relationship to the idea of free will might be? How do you conceive of it? Um, you know, it's one of those ideas that if it gets you someplace you want to go, use it. If not, don't. Same thing with uh, ideas of you know, there being no uh, possibility of autonomous agency. If that does something that helps you get to some place you want to go with your life and your projects, it can be useful. Is it reality? I don't believe it. Is either reality? I don't believe either of them. But I think for more of my projects, an idea of free will is going to be uh, more uh, useful for me. Um, but ultimately, I don't care. It's, it's not a matter of what the idea is. It's a matter of living my life. Uh, uh, my life before all the concepts comes first, and I hope that your life um, you can uh, consciously and critically understand also uh, is more important as you live it than the ideas you have about how it's made up. If we can all just use whatever concepts work best for uh, enjoying our world together, interrelating in every possible way that gives us joy, um, 
then uh, I think we're going to be better off, and that's what I'd like to see. Is it going to happen necessarily? No, not necessarily. Only if we do it. <laughs> Why not? Okay, so right now you're working on Modern Slavery Volume Number 4, is that right? Or is mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Can you talk a bit about this project? Uh, where did it come from? Why did you decide to leave Anarchy, a Journal of Desire arm to do this project? And what are your goals? What is, what's your perceived audience? Uh, basically, I loved uh, publishing Anarchy, the Journal of Desire Armed. I did it for 25 years. Um, it was much more enjoyable when it was a directly collective project. Um, so originally we had uh, you know, a housing co-op. Uh, a lot of people lived there and local people active. We had uh, meetings uh, for publishing. Uh, we'd have five or ten people uh, on a consistent basis, always involved, and it was. I, I like to work on collective projects directly with people. Um, but over time, uh, many of those people moved away. Didn't have uh, new people join who uh, became ever as uh, closely involved, and so the project basically dwindled down to a couple people, of, and then basically me. And then, of course, there were other people always involved, but they were at a distance. I didn't get to talk to them every day. I didn't get to, or even once a week, didn't get to have meetings with them. It was less enjoyable to publish uh, a journal that had a lot of demands on my life and time uh, that way. Not that I still didn't enjoy it, but um, I uh, had more things I wanted, other things I wanted to do with my life as well, which conflicted increasingly. And so I eventually gave the project away to the collective in Berkeley, which um, is finally, uh, I think, really hitting its stride now and publishing some really uh, intelligent, uh, beautiful uh, issues these days. Uh, and I encourage everybody who hasn't been paying attention to Anarchy Magazine to uh, uh, look for it and uh, check it out because I think it is a very valuable uh, publication within the milieu. Uh, but one of the thing, my, one of my Problems, I guess, I had with the journal, with the with the Anarchy magazine, was the limitations of the format, which basically meant, well, it was 80 pages, 84 pages, I guess, most of the time. Once in a while, 100 or something, uh, but mostly 80, uh, especially in the last uh, decade. Um, that meant that if I was going to have much variety of things, I didn't usually ever want to have anything in there that was more than eight pages uh, for, per essay, um, whereas there's, I think, a lot of things that are 20 pages or 40 pages that are very well <laughs> valuable, and I don't want to just publish excerpts um, uh, in a magazine format like that. So I was feeling a little bit fettered by that uh, format, and I wanted to do something different. So originally I thought... I'll, I'll keep doing Anarchy Magazine, but I'll also then eventually publish a journal that's larger and gives me the opportunity to publish 40 or 60 or 80 page pieces that I think would benefit from more exposure and that I think are really important. Uh, but then uh, I realized I just don't have the time, didn't have the time for that, so I decided to give up on the, the magazine, um, at least not give up on it, but not do it myself, <laughs> give other people the opportunity to carry it forward. And I thought if a collective here in Berkeley uh, would be able to do that, they would have more uh, opportunities to make it a more successful project than I would uh, being more isolated in Missouri. Um, so anyway, Modern Slavery Project basically uh, took the name from a previous mm -hmm. uh, little ephemeral uh, tabloid that we used to, free tabloid we used to publish in Columbia, Missouri, and, and uh, give away once or twice a year uh, that was titled Modern Slavery and had you know, elements of humor in it, and, and it, was, uh, it was a fun little project. It wasn't uh, a real serious thing, but I liked the title, so I thought that would make a nice title um, for, uh, and, and also at the same time give a theme as a critique of modern slavery for a more uh, complex, uh, larger journal. And so now we're doing Modern Slavery, which is 200 pages for each issue, or 204, whatever it might be, um, uh, and allows 
for a large article. So we've had uh, 40 pages, 50 pages maybe, uh, articles in there, which you couldn't usually publish anywhere. And uh, amazingly enough, uh, we published the journal and we put it on newsstands across North America. And uh, some people actually buy it on a newsstand for twelve ninety five, which is, you know, the, the whole project to have, was never intended for newsstands because it's totally insane. And you can't expect anybody <laughs> to go to a, a U.S. or Canadian even newsstand and look at a big tome like this that's t so, totally foreign to them and think they're ever going to buy it. But, hey, it's putting it out there means at least people get exposed to it and they can read it until it gets pulped or whatever. Uh, but... The amazing thing about it is we actually sell about a third of them that go out on the newsstands, which is totally unheard of for something like as totally bizarre as this project is. So what can we do? We can be uh, happy as long as we can keep publishing it. We're gonna, it's always going to be money losing. Um, it's not a typical thing because if you want to have a non-money losing publication, you have to have advertising, which we're never going to have. Uh, and at the least, you have to have something that you can sell subscriptions with, which People aren't subscribing very much, so it basically is going to be totally money losing, and I'll just do it as long as we can. Uh, those who contribute will put some money into it, and, and anybody else who wants to um, help with the project, hey, help us uh, find readers and uh, buy a couple extra copies and uh, distribute it. Otherwise, uh, it won't be here forever, but we'll do it as long as we can. So something I've been asking everyone I can recently is that as post-left post anarchists who are skeptical of or even hostile toward the idea of mass, whether it's mass society, mass communication, some sort of mass movement, even a radical mass movement, what does it mean to you to be putting out something that, even if it's smaller, is still a kind of mass communication, a mass media? How do you navigate the tension between wanting to spread anarchist ideas, post-left anarchist ideas, wanting people to have certain kinds of conversations, as you said, even the, the people on the newsstand picking this up and saying, oh, okay, well, you know, what's this? Uh, wanting that on the one hand, and then also being averse to any kind of propagandistic or demagogical acts. You know, I'm not averse per se to propaganda. Um, okay. You know, as far as if you mean by that, putting ideas out. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all I want to do. I want to put stimulating ideas out. I don't want to impose anything. We have no dogma to impose. Mm -hmm. We have a suggestion to make that uh, you know, people consider taking control of their own lives uh, consciously and creatively. Um, and in order to do that, that they resist all massifying uh, uh, institutions and projects um, and that they, you know, we can do things uh, in, uh, what can we say, uh, uh, more insurrectionary, uh, more of a mob kind of uh, format, which means everybody individually taking control of what you're doing along with uh, your small groups of friends and neighbors and uh, uh, associates uh, to whatever degree you can. And that's basically what anarchy is, is each small group relating to other small groups, each individual relating to other individuals, um, groups of small groups relating to other groups of small groups, other places and federation uh, type of uh, arrangements that are not imposed from above but always built from below. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with trying to put your ideas out where other people can see them. Um, Basically, just like with language being uh, a tool that we use that has advantages and disadvantages and has, works better for some things than others and is really hard to do certain projects with, well, journals, same kind of thing. Uh, they have advantages and disadvantages. There are the advantages, hey, other people will see what I'm thinking, you know, written format um, on a wide scale. Disadvantages, hey, I'm not talking to them directly. I don't get to see their face. I don't get to you know, experience part of their lives while they're experiencing part of mine. We don't get to learn from each other so directly. But, hey, it's better than nothing, and it's one way of, uh, for my, for me to have a practice that uh, is not uh, stuck in the typical leftist tiny self mode, <laughs> uh, but is more expansive. I mean, I reach out to other people in this way, and I try not to try to always make it as clear as possible that I'm not telling them they should do anything in particular. I'm inviting them to do things with other people in an open and cooperative and um, self-mastering format. 
And lastly, I want to ask, what does a post-left anarchist praxis look like to you? So, you know, I guess what I just said. Okay. okay. <laughs> post-left praxis, yes. Um, you know, doing something with other people that yeah. subverts all power structures that uh, demand submission um, as much as possible without being suicidal, preferably. I mean, if you want to be suicidal, I can't stop you, but you know, that's not what I would like to suggest to people, um, uh, you know, do whatever you can. Every little thing helps, especially start with your, uh, you know, the most immediate things that you experience the most often in your own lives that are restrictive and try to loosen them up. Um, try to uh, encourage all your friends to think about things in a more uh, open, uh, uh, less submissive manner. Um, I guarantee for many people, that if you do that, you're going to have a more enjoyable life already, even if the world in a larger scale doesn't change, if you have even a group of friends that all have a particular uh, subversive uh, attitude towards uh, institutions of enslavement. It's just more fun to hang out with them. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are so deeply uh, uh, constrained and so deeply uh, uh, conditioned that they find such a such attitudes to be threatening, well, you can start wherever you can start and work on whatever part of your life uh, you can. And you might uh, figure out that if you start loosening up some things that, hey, there is some benefit to this, I do feel a little freer, and you might gain the confidence then to attack more entrenched uh, conservative uh, or, say, uh, even liberal attitudes of submission or leftist attitudes of submission or even uh, you know, highly radical attitudes of submission. Um, if you believe really in the necessity for civilization, um, you don't have to attack that at first. You can start with other things and, and you might get eventually to the point where you can understand that in most cases, most people use of the word civilization is talking about a huge monolithic uh, uh, idea of all the institutions of slavery that uh, have developed uh, since the beginning, since the dawn of uh, human history. Um, but, you know, you don't have to worry about that immediately. You can start with other things first and, and work yourself up to that. Uh, all I would suggest is everybody try whatever you can, and if all of us do that, we'll potentially uh, have a snowballing effect that grows and grows by mutually reinforcing each other's efforts. And that could lead to a, you know, an explosion and a change in everyday life that also would be synonymous with a uh, insurrectionary change in uh, our world. Mm -hmm. Anything else you'd like to discuss, Jason? Oh, there's a million things I'd like to discuss, but as everybody can tell already, I like to talk when given the chance on subjects close to my heart. Um, so I guess the only thing I'd say is Anyone who has uh, any interest in these subjects, please pick up a copy of uh, Anarchy, a Journal of Desire Arm. Please pick up a copy of uh, Modern Slavery. Uh, please consider supporting the projects uh, since they are nonprofit and anti-profit and uh, hard to maintain because of that. Um, and they're open submission, right? Yeah, certainly. We're always looking for people who want to contribute. Um, I suggest... Usually, if you aren't already writing things on a scale of uh, uh, that, that you're contributing to other publications, you might want to start by just sending a letter. And I'm always, I love letters. Um, great. Something from before the age of computers, right? You yeah. might remember those. So, but write a letter, <laughs> write an email even, but, you know, an email that's at least as intelligent as letters used to be. Uh, <laughs> and we'll publish it, right? <laughs> Uh, and it will respond to it if, it if you ask for a response. Um, and uh, we'd like to have some interaction more than what, what happens. And, uh, you know, if there's any forums that uh, are, are happening uh, locally or regionally that, uh, any, uh, that I'm at or that any other post-leftists are at, please, you know, engage in conversation. I think conversations are more fun than publication. Uh, but I don't get a chance to do that as much as I, because we, you know, tend to be very isolated in modern society and uh, problems with uh, one person living uh, down the block from somebody else and not having any idea about who they are because they don't, their paths don't cross. You know, you might have 
somebody you love to be in touch with, but you don't even know who they are because you walk by them every day, but you don't get a chance to uh, find out anything about them. Same thing with me. You know, I'm, I'm here in the Bay Area. Uh, anybody who would like to talk to me, I'm open to talking. But I don't know where you are, and you don't know where I am usually. But, hey, we can find each other through publications and uh, through uh, uh, things like the Bastard Conference, which I assume is going to be coming up soon. April, yeah. Yeah, I'll be there if I can. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Jason. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. I'm always available. Cool.